Okay, um, hello everyone. Welcome to uh, this Karkinet book launch and thank you for joining us to celebrate the publication of This Afterlife, Selected Poems by A.E. Stallings. Um, I'm Jasmine, I'm from Karkinet Press and I'm just going to run over a bit of housekeeping before we get started. Uh, so tonight uh, we'll be together for about one hour. Um, I can see that loads of you have already found the chat box. Please do find the chat. Um, let us know, you know, how cold it is where you are. <laughs> Maybe you'll win. Um, let us know what you think of the reading. Please just do get involved in the conversation in the chat box uh, throughout the event. Um, please make sure while you're using the chat that you've selected the option for everyone uh, before you send your message. Otherwise, we won't all be able to see each other's messages. Um, now, tonight, um, during the poetry reading, I'm going to have the text up on screen for you, um, just as a bit of a visual guide while Alicia is reading. Um, you're in control of your screen, so if you need Alicia's face to be bigger and the text to be smaller, just have a click around um, and you should be able to reconfigure it. With anything, if you have any technical problems, please just put it in the chat and I'll do my best to help you as I go through the event. Um, Later this evening, uh, Alicia is going to be discussing the work with Angie Mlinko, who I'm very, very, very pleased is joining us from the States. Um, she'll also be able to put your questions to Alicia later on. So as well as finding the chat box, please, can you find another button? <laughs> Not that complicated, um, which says Q&A on it. And if you get your questions for Alicia lined up in the Q&A box, then Angie will be able to put them to her later on in the event. Um, so finally from me, um, thank you so much for paying your two pounds to be here. We really appreciate your support. Um, there is a discount code and a link for you, um, which I'm going to drop into the chat now. Um, this will also come in as, as an email tomorrow, so um, you can check your emails and get your copy of the book then. Um, you don't need to rush to do it now. But a note on that is that um, we are not the American publishers of this book. Um, so if you're in the States or Canada, you need to head to FSG to get the American edition. Um, and I'm sorry that your code won't work if you're in the UK. But thank you for being here. Um, and I'm very excited to begin properly. OK, so. Um, we are, as I mentioned, joined by Angie Malinko, who is the author of six books of poetry, um, for which she's been highly accoladed. Uh, most recent collection came out this year, it's called Venice. Um, so go and check that out if you don't know it. Um, she's also a critic. She appears regularly in the London Review of Books and the New York Review of Books. Um, so you can seek her work out online. Um, and I'm very, very pleased to invite her on screen to join me so we can begin. Hi, thank you, Jasmine. It is an honor and a pleasure to introduce my illustrious friend and contemporary A.E. Stallings on the occasion of her first reading from her brand new book, The Afterlife, Selected Poems. The Afterlife gathers work from four collections of poetry published between 1999 and 2018, Archaic Smile, Hapax, Olives, and like. Additionally, it includes a sprinkling of translations from 20th century Greek poets, Angelo Sikelianos and George Seferis, and a lanyap of previously published but uncollected poems. A lanyap, if you didn't know, is something given as a bonus. It is extra. It comes from Louisiana Creole, and Mark Twain himself called it, quote, one excellent word, a word worth traveling to New Orleans to get. This is one aspect of Stallings' generosity as a poet. At the intersection of her native English and her adopted languages of Greek and Latin, she excavates gorgeous words as we might have forgotten or never knew, like lanyap or hapax or quincunx. Words are one kind of gift, whole lines are another. Stallings' lines have the memorability of old songs, old song lyrics. After the argument, all things were strange. Deep in the wood where things escape their names. Smoke follows beauty. The rain is haunted, I had forgotten. All, all of the stories are about going to bed. A third gift Stallings provides her readers, 
the beauty and rightness of her similes. From an airplane, islands in the sea appear, quote, dribbled like pancake batter. Olives are served, quote, on a plate cracked like a tooth. A violin is light as an exile's suitcase. She has a special predilection for animals. Bats are a recurring motif. And in two separate poems written years apart, bats, quote, move like new tunes difficult to follow. And later, a small brown bat flinched into the air, ragged as the inside of a pocket. I could go on. I realize I'm practically composing a blazon of sweet beauties, as Shakespeare put it, the way troubadours listed and praised the attributes of their mistress's bodies. So might we list and praise the attributes of a body of work. For from the word to the line, the line to the villanelle, or sonnet, or sestina, or terza rima, Stallings's poems shine in their parts and cohere in their holes. They inspire the wise nod, the rueful laugh, the pang at the heart. They are meant to be memorized and repeated, to be savored. Born in Atlanta, Georgia, and educated at the University of Georgia and Oxford, A.E. Stallings joins us tonight from Athens, Greece, where she has lived for over two decades, married to the journalist John Saropoulos and mother to their two children. In addition to her previous four books of poetry, which have won numerous awards, Like was also a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize, she has public, published acclaimed translations of Lucretius's The Nature of Things, Hesiod's Works and Days, and the Homeric little epic, The Battle Between Frogs and the Mice. In her dual capacity as classicist and poet, she has been a Guggenheim Fellow, a MacArthur Fellow, and a United States Artist Fellow. Her essays and reviews have been published widely from the Times Literary Supplement to The American Scholar. I highly recommend her TED Talk on YouTube, which compares poetic inspiration to the flight, not of birds, but of bats. I might also mention that like Lord Byron, she is a champion swimmer. And so without further ado, I now pass the mic over to A.E. Stallings. Uh, start my video. Hello, that was, um, I'm very moved by, by that amazing um, introduction. <laughs> and I will want to have a copy of that um, for when I'm feeling low. Um, it's, it's a great honor to be introduced by Angie Linko, who is um, uh, perhaps the poet of my own generation um, that I am I'm most in awe of myself. Um, and it's also wonderful to to have a, a literary friendship with with such a with such a intelligence and um, generosity. So it's been um, quite an experience gathering together um, these uh, poems from my previous writing life um, uh, to look back on where I have been, um, hopefully to get a sense of where I might be going. <laughs> Um, and I'm really excited to, to have um, this collection um, with Carcanet. Um, it's my first volume of poetry to appear in the UK, and I'm, I'm super excited about that. Um, I'm going to sort of read chronologically a few poems. Um, this first poem, Persephone Writes a Letter to Her Mother, uh, is from my first collection, Archaic Smile. Um, it deals with uh, Greek mythology, as many of my poems do. I'm, you all probably, of course, know the myth of Hades, who seizes this, this young nymph who's picking flowers, Persephone, and he brings her down to the underworld. And Ovid um, makes that kind of a etiological myth about um, uh, winter and spring, um, as does, I think, the Homeric hymn. Um, but uh, I don't know that there is a, a, a spring in this poem. Um, it was written uh, when I lived in Atlanta. I lived in a basement apartment. It was written in a basement apartment. Um, and in fact, 
in the basement of John Crow niece's house. <laughs> so, um, so you'll see that uh, some of this is metaphorical, but some of it from the writer's perspective, I suppose, is, is quite literal. First, hell is not so far underground. My hair gets tangled in the roots of trees, and I can just make out the crunch of footsteps, the pop of acorns falling, or the chime of a shovel squaring a fresh grave, or turning up the tulip bulbs for separation. Day and night, creatures with no legs or too many journey to hell and back. Alas, the burrowing animals have dim eyesight. They are useless for news of the upper world. They say the light is loud. Their figures of speech all come from sound. Their hearing is acute. The dead are just as dull as you would imagine. They evolve like the burrowing animals, losing their sight. They may roam abroad sometimes, but just at night, they can only tell me if there was a moon. Again and again, moth-like, they are duped by any beckoning flame, lamps, and candles. They come back startled and singed, sucking their fingers, happy the dirt is cool and dense and blind. They are silly and grateful and don't remember anything. I have tried to tell them stories, but they cannot attend. They pester you like children for the wrong details. How long were his fingernails? Did she wear shoes? How much did they eat for breakfast? What is snow? And then they pay no attention to the answers. My husband, bored with their babbling, neither listens nor speaks. But here there is no fodder for small talk. The weather is always the same. Nothing happens, though at times I feel the trees rocking in place like grief, clenching the dirt with tortuous toes. There is nothing to eat here but raw beets and turnips. There is nothing to drink but mud-filtered rain. Of course, no one goes hungry or toils, however many. The dead breed like the bulbs of daffodils, without sex or seed, all underground, yet no race has such increase, worse than insects. I miss you and think about you often. Please send flowers. I am forgetting them. If I yank them down by the roots, they lose their petals and smell of compost. Though I try to describe their color and fragrance, no one here believes me. They think they are the same thing as mushrooms. Yet no dog is so loyal as the dead, who have no wives or children and no lives, no motives secret or bare to disobey. Plus my husband is a kind, kind master. He asks nothing of us, nothing, nothing at all. Thus fall changes to winter, winter to fall, while we learn idleness, a difficult lesson. A second um, poem that I was gonna read from that first collection, Archaic Smile, which was published just as I moved to Greece, um, but it kind of represents this, this life before Greece um, where um, there is Greek mythology, but it is, it's coming from a different place, um, certainly. Um, but this poem, The Man Who Wouldn't Plant Willow Trees is definitely a Georgia poem. It feels very much like from my Georgia days. Um, and uh, it started off as something uh, entirely else. And I wrote this and then I thought, no, this is the poem. And so that was one of those, those learning lessons where I wanted to write something else and I wrote this instead. The man who wouldn't plant willow trees. Willows are messy trees. Hair in their eyes, they weep like women after too much wine and not enough love. They litter a lawn with leaves like the butts of regrets smoked down to the filter. They are always out of kilter. Thirsty as drunks, they'll sink into a sewer with their roots. They have no pride. There's never enough sorrow. A breeze threatens and they shake with sobs. Willows are slobs and must be cleaned up after. They'll bust up pipes just looking for a drink. Their fingers tremble, but make wicked switches. They claim they are sorry, 
they whisper it. So my, my second collection, Hapax, um, was written, I think, almost entirely in Greece. I mean, I think it does still have some, some Georgia poems. And obviously, you know, the poems about childhood are, are from there. Um, it also has uh, poems that deal with Greek mythology. And this poem is dealing with the same myth of Hades and Persephone. It's called First Love, a quiz. I write almost exclusively in received forms. Um, so, you know, sonnets or iambic pentameter or um, haiku stanzas. Um, but I sort of realized there are other kinds of received forms that are not poetic forms, but that can be made into poetic forms. And this was kind of fun to write using a very different kind of convention. First love a quiz. He came up to me, A, in his souped up Camaro, B, to talk to my skinny best friend, C, and bumped my glass of wine so I wore the fairest stain on my sleeve, D, from the ground in a lead chariot drawn by a team of stallions black as crude oil and breathing sulfur. At his heart, he sported a tiny golden arrow. He offered me A, a ride, B, dinner and a movie with a wink at the cliche, C, an excuse not to go back alone to the apartment with its sink of dirty knives. D, a narcissus with a hundred dazzling petals that breathed a sweetness as cloying as decay. I went with him because, A, even his friends told me to beware. B, I had nothing to lose except my virginity. C, he placed his hand in the small of my back and I felt the tread of honeybees. D, he was my uncle, the one who lived in the half finished basement and he took me by the hair. The place he took me to, A, was dark as my shut eyes, B, and where I ate bitter seed and became ripe, C, and from which my mother would never take me wholly back, though she wept and walked the earth and made the bearded ears of barley wither on their stalks and the blasted flowers drop from their sepals. D is called by some men hell and others love E. All of the above. So, um, Moving on to Olives, which also was written almost entirely in Greece. Um, but there is this, I think, on the one hand, engagement with Greek mythology from the position of living in Greece. Um, but then there's all, also always the casting back um, to the past. Um, and one of the things I think I realized with the selected is certainly Greek mythology is a, a big theme. Um, animals, as Angie said, uh, particularly dead animals are a big theme, and bats. Um, uh, but music, it turns out, is also a, a big thing. And I think um, I actually in college, I was originally a, a minor in music, and I spent a lot of my high school, you know, in orchestra and all of that. Um, so the sort of um, all of those years with instruments kind of haunt the pages as well. This one is called Two Violins. And um, I guess maybe it is kind of more of a Georgia poem now that I think about it. And is also, also a true story as it were. Two violins. One was fire red, hand carved and new. The local maker pried the wood from a torn down church's pew, the devil's instrument wrenched from the house of God. It answered merrily and clear, though my fingering was flawed, bright and sharp as a young wine, they said, but it would mellow and that I would grow into it. The other one was yellow and nicked down at the chin, a varnish of Baltic amber, a one piece back of tiger maple and a low dark timbre. 
A century old, they said, its sound will never change. Rich and deep on G and D, thin on the upper range. And how it came from the old world was anybody's guess. Light as an exile suitcase, a belly of emptiness. That was the one I chose, not the one of flame. And teachers turned in their practiced hands to see whence the sad notes came. I guess um, in, in, in the Greek myths that I write about, um, they're often about um, the underworld or the afterlife. So I think this afterlife um, suited uh, the book as a title. Um, but I think for me, Greek mythology is not really essentially any different to fairy tales or to other myths, um, more constructed myths, um, such as Alice in Wonderland, and in this poem, Alice in the Looking Glass, um, she too is somebody who has a catabasis and travels to an underworld or an other world. And um, of course, her name is, is not dissimilar to my own. Um, so this is called Alice in the Looking Glass. It is one of many, many sonnets that are in the book. Um, sonnet is kind of a default form for me, or indeed for the English language or um, many languages. Uh, I guess what this one is kind of fun to me in writing it and different is that rather than um, having regular rhymes, you know, sound rhymes, these are conceptual rhymes. They're opposite rhymes. So things rhyme with their opposite. And that was quite fun to construct in this poem about mirrors, Alice in the Looking Glass. No longer can I just climb through the time is past for going back, but you are there still conning books in Hebrew, right to left, or moving little jars on the dresser top like red and white pieces on a chessboard. Still, you look up curiously at me when I pass as if you'd ask me something, maybe why I've got you locked inside. I'd say because that is where I'd have reflections stay, in surfaces, where they cannot disquiet, shallow for all that they seem deep at bottom. Though it's to you, I look to set things right, the blouse askew, hair silvering here and here, where everything reverses, save for time. Going along to um, my collection, like, uh, with my most recent collection, um, which is organized somewhat differently to the, the previous ones, which have kind of standard poetry collection organizations where, you know, things are grouped into different sections. And I was like, I didn't want to do that. So I just threw all the poems into alphabetical order and magically um, they seem to have their own um, order in, in there. It seemed to work. Uh, and um, it also makes them much easier to find <laughs> than in some of the other books. Um, this poem is called Art Monster. Um, uh, the Minotaur is uh, also a favorite creature of mine. Um, I, I feel sorry for him in the labyrinth. He's perhaps also one of my, one of my unloved animals. But anyway, he's, he's a favorite and is in, in lots of different poems. Um, Art monster. My mother fell for beauty, although it was another species. Ox eyed, dew lapped, groomed for sacrifice. She had to devise another self to put herself in something inhuman or beauty could not possess her. Oh, deedle mechanics. She grew huge with hybridity, rumor ripened. I was born to be amazed. She fascinated me with cats' cradles, spun threads out of my hirsute hair shirt. I was fed on raw youths and maidens when all I wanted was the cud of clover. I was named after my stepfather, 
dispenser of judgment. No one called me my mother's son. Minotaur, they said, oh, Minotaur, you are unnatural, grotesque. A hero will come to slay you. A hero who jilts princesses on desert islands. It is heroic to slay, to break a heart, to solve the archaic puzzle in the basement. Demonster the darkness. I await this patiently as I bow to the yoke of making, scratching this earliest of inscriptions on a pot shard down here in the midden, writing left to right, then right to left, as a broken beast furrows a field. I see that I also have an obsession with them. Um, uh, writing right to left and left to right. Um, this poem is called Momentary. Um, it is one of, I guess, an animal poem, um, although I'll leave it, leave it to you to decide what animal it is. It's, I think, very influenced by Elizabeth Bishop and the Sandpiper. Um, you'll see where that happens. Um, but uh, anyway, I'll read it. Momentary. I never glimpse her, but she goes, who had been basking in the sun, her links of chain mail one by one, a glint with pewter, bronze, and rose. I never see her lying coiled atop the garden step or under a dark leaf unless I blunder, and by some motion she is foiled. Too late, I notice as she passes zither of chromatic scale. I only ever see her tail quicksilver into tall grasses. I know her only by her flowing, by her glamour disappearing into shadow as I'm nearing. I only recognize her going. This is another animal poem, Swallows from Like, um, an experiment in Atavarima. Um, and I think a different interaction with Greek myth or Greek myth as transmitted by Ovid, as Ovid actually does a lot of that transmitting, um, in that it's rather than re-inhabiting a myth, um, is engaging directly with the literary retelling of the myth. Um, and also very much about life in modern Greece. Um, so uh, anyway, swallows. Every year the swallows come and put their homestead in repair and raise another brood and skim and boomerang through summer air and reap mosquitoes from the hum of holidays, a handsome pair one on the nest, one on the wire. Cheat, 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 the two conspire to murder half the insect race and feed them, squirming to their chicks. They work and fret at such a pace and natter in between with clicks and chirs. They lift the raftered place, seaside taverna, with their tricks of cursive loops and morse code call, both analog and digital. They seem to us so coupled, married, so flustered with their needful young, so busy housekeeping, so harried. It's hard to picture them among the origins of myth, a buried secret rape, a cut out tongue, two sisters wronged where there's no right till transformation fledges flight. But Ovid swapped them in the tale so that the sister who was forced becomes instead the nightingale who sings as though her heart would burst. It's Ovid's stories that prevail, and thus the swallow is divorced twice from her voice, her tuneless chatter, and no one asks her what's the matter. These swallows, though, don't have the knack for sorrow, or we'd not have guessed. Those smartly dressed in tailored black spend no time mourning, do not rest. One scissors forth, one zigzags back. They take turns settled on the nest or waiting on a perch nearby to zero in on wasp or fly. 
they have no time for tragic song. As dusk distills, they dart and flicker. The days are long, but not as long as yesterday. The night comes quicker, and soon the season will be wrong. Knackered, cross, they bitch and bicker, like you and me. They never learn, and every summer they return. So I had an opportunity with this book. Um, we decided not to include new poems. It wasn't going to be a new and selected, but I did want people to have something extra, you know, if they were completists and had all the other books. Um, and there were uh, several poems that I think always kind of niggled at me that I hadn't included them in collections. And that was usually because they just didn't fit thematically. Um, you know, sometimes they were a seasonal poem, but, you know, I felt some of them still held up. Um, and we also included some translations. Um, as, as we're in Advent and uh, entering the Christmas season, this is one of those, um, the Magi. Um, I know it's it's risky to write a Magi poem because there's so many great ones, but that's also, I think the the temptation is to, you know, to add your own and, you know, with your own take on it. Um, so this is the Magi. Christmas Eve. The word made flesh. We put baby in the manger, but could not add them to the crush. They still had miles of doubt and danger. They set out from the staircase landing, traveling lightly and untrammeled. One was kneeling, one was standing, and our favorite was camels. Past falling cards and other perils, they crossed the piano's dark plateau where someone fumbled Christmas carols, sang of silence, stars, and snow. They camped wherever they were able, a potted fern for an oasis, from shelf to windowsill to table, night by night we'd change their places. The thrill of our own gifts forgot, no longer knew the batteries gone dead. At last they'd reached the spot, one king already on his knees, one kneeling while the camel grunted, 12 whole days of Christmas hence, to give what no child ever wanted, gold and myrrh and frankincense. Thank you. Well done, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> so strange to be like reading from the book and it's on the screen where to look <laughs> actually I'm so grateful for that I've never seen that done before and I I always find it helpful to follow along with the reading and I've taught so many of those poems and you know um I you, that magi poem in particular is one of my favorites it reminds me of jo Joseph Brodsky's Christmas poems oh, so thank you so I guess to start things off, I thought I would ask, um, I told you, I think it's difficult for me and I think for many poets to look back at their early work. Um, did anything strike you or surprise you about yourself, your predilections, your themes in the process of assembling this afterlife? I mean, I think, you know, some of you're sort of surprised at some things that you return to a lot, um, but also, I think one of the things you you look back at poems and you know maybe you you like them but you realize you couldn't write them now they're they're just poems where you know you could write them at that point in time and you know maybe this would even you know you might like to be able to write that kind of poem again but you kind of you're not in that space anymore um certainly like in the early poems there's a lot more you know, experiment in in kind of blank verse and unrhymed um, forms that, um, you know, maybe that would be like something I might want to revisit more of. But, um, you know, and then there also were like long baggy poems when I was selecting, you know, and I was thinking, oh, this is a chance to remove that one. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so it's certainly, you know, a chance of, of, of fine tuning and, and trying to get the better poems. 
But you mentioned that you didn't actually uh, do any revisions, unlike say Auden or Marianne Moore, you didn't go back and try to make something perfect that you didn't. No, I mean, I just, I, I feel very strongly that, especially if, I almost, if something has even appeared in a journal, very occasionally I will change something if it is in print, if it's a real mistake or something that really bugs me. But I kind of feel someone else wrote it and you know, I don't really want to interfere with it. There very occasionally, I might tinker with a title or an epigraph or something. There is a poem in here that I I changed the 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 way I grouped lines. There's an early villanelle in the Lanyep, um, where for a long time I thought it would be more interesting if rather than having tercets, 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 you know, and then a quatrain. I made it wonkier and made it into quatrains and end with a tercet. Um, but generally, I kind of feel this is someone else's poem. And my main interest, I think, would be if I have something that I've learned from, like a mistake or something that I've learned from that, I'd like to carry that forward into a new poem and just kind of wipe my hands of that. I, that may be incorrect. But I think also because a lot of the poems are, are quite formal, um, change it's it's not easy to change something either I mean you know you have to really kind of go in surgically or you know if you've got a rhyme scheme or something it would be very difficult so I I tend to leave them alone mm -hmm. I don't know how you feel about um revisiting and tinkering um I mean if it's a temptation I suppose and I think the word surgical is right um but I think that the people who did do that, you know, people like Auden or Moore, they were distracting themselves by changing yeah. their work. Um, yeah. When I think the approach that you take is probably healthier of just forging ahead and writing something new. Yeah. I mean, oh, you think of like John Crow Ransom where, you know, we have these kind of perfect versions, but then he goes on and does other editions and kind of ruins, um, you know, poems that are that are perfect. And I, I'm not saying that I'm at that level, but um, it's a cautionary tale. I think. Yeah, one wouldn't want to do that. No. Um, well, you know, tell me about your poetic education. I don't think we ever talked about it, but, you know, what was the young Alicia starting out like? What was she reading? And is there anything um, that you would tell her now? Or what do you think she got right? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, well, I think I, I was quite serious about poetic vocation very early on, maybe starting even in high school, or at least I wanted to be a writer. And um, I was very serious about T.S. Eliot, particularly. Um, so it's kind of been interesting to come round and with the centenary and, um, you know, coming as an adult appreciator, I think I didn't really understand very much, but yeah. like the sounds and the, the textures and the images, you know, and it was just also some of it is just sort of luck. Um, the books that you run into or, you know, we spent a lot of time at my grandparents house in Louisville, Kentucky, and my grandfather was a an Episcopal priest. And, you know, once we got through all the fairy tales, you kind of went looking at the adult bookshelves and those were all scary theological things. But then there was like T.S. Eliot and C.S. Lewis, you know, <laughs> and you could kind of, and I think there was also this sense of, you know, the, there was whiteness on the page. There was a lot of space on the page. So even though it was an adult book, it wasn't frightening. Maybe it should have been, but, you know, I don't know. To me, it was like, oh, this is almost like a children's book. There's, you know, there's there's space on the page. And um, I didn't really know how to go about being a writer. Oh, I was um, I was obsessed with publishing as a teenager. I, I published like my early poems in Seventeen magazine and I made money, better money than babysitting. So this was, a, this was obviously not the lesson I should have learned from that about poetry. But, um, and you know, I, I thought, oh, I can do this. I can write poems and get published. And, you know, later I realized that's not really how it works. And um, I think partly part of the reason I went into classics is I thought this is what, how poets educated themselves. Again, maybe this idea of, from it's Eliot. <laughs> um, you know, I, I became kind of obsessed also with A.E. Hausman, two opposites in a way, but, um, you know, you think about The Wasteland is published the same year as Hausman's last poem. So, you know, they're still, they're in the air at the same time in, in their odd, strange 
opposite ways. So I didn't know better. I didn't, you know, I, there, I think it wasn't also as obvious to go through an MFA program as it would be now. I think now that's what I would have done, but I just, I didn't know to do that. So I thought, you know, poets studied classics and, um, and it was much more accidental, all of it. I went through a whole year where I did nothing but read Robert Graves, you know, I mean, who does that? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I found a, a John Crow Ransom, you know, book at the used bookstore and then realized I was living in his niece's house. <laughs> you know, it's just Well, that's a good, that's, a, you know, um, interesting that you bring up these very particular Southern writers, because other writers, you know, I grew up in the Northeast and, you know, I certainly, T.S. Eliot was certainly my entree into poetry, but I didn't read John Crow Ransom um, or, you know, any real of uh, the Southern formalists um, until much later. And so I wonder how much growing up in Georgia had to do with that. I think that was a factor because I think one of the things as any any apprentice writer starts to look around and see, is, is there anyone kind of like me? Is there anyone I can model myself on? Whether it's someone that looks like you or is the same gender or, um, and one of those things is it, Atlanta is just not a poetic town. It is not, <laughs> it's, you know, I've been there. The whole point of it. it's like an anti-poetic town. And um, so you're like searching for people. I mean, I would, my my father would take me to anyone who was reading at Georgia State or Agnes Scott or um, or Georgia Tech. I mean, I saw amazing people. I saw um, Stephen Spender. I, I mean, I saw all these people that were coming through, but you know, you, you would go to several readings by James Dickey who would, you know, sometimes be amazing and generous and other times be quite, you know, out of his mind with, with whatever substance he was using and be very rude. Um, but, you know, he was almost the only kind of Atlanta writer that I could point to. There was also um, David Bottoms um, uh, at Georgia State. And, and then I kind of stumbled on Turner Cassidy. I think, again, I found a book at the like Dec downtown Decatur Library and kind of opened it up. It might have been Watch Boy, What is the Night? And there, these, there were these very tidy, um, you know, formal um, austere, you know, poems. Um, but one of them was about, um, the Fox theater in Atlanta. And I, I was just so taken aback. I mean, cause okay. There's like the James Dickey. I'm, I'm also a big fan of the early motion. Um, but these are all kind of mythological and, you know, in the forest and whatever, and that someone could write about this, um, this theater with all of these sort of Egyptian decorations from the twenties or thirties. Um, actually, probably directly after um, Tutankhamun's tomb, when it was, you know, very um, popular to have these garish kind of Egyptian type um, decorations. But, you know, that it could be the subject of a poem. And I think, um, you know, I, I'm not a country girl. I, you know, grew up in, you know, very suburban Atlanta. Um, so even though, like, I did spend a lot of time in the woods and stuff, but, um, you know, seeing that landmark in Atlanta and in a poetic form. I think that was that was one of those moments where you thought, oh, I too can can be engaged in this. Um, coming from where I come from, you know, not, you know, reading so many English poets growing up, for instance, you think, oh, I, I can't do this. I'm not a male English person. <laughs> um, but, you know, seeing other other people doing it, I think is always important, you know, even if they're not like your favorite poem poets, um, and may not even be your touchstone poems, um, those things that give you permission, I think, to, to do whatever it is you do. And what did Greek and Latin poetry teach you? Um, well, I think, like, again, I sort of stumbled into classics. My interest was really in um, classical reception. I think it always has been in how classics filters into English poems. Um, but, you know, I kind of wanted to go to the source. And I did end up in a Catullus seminar. It was a graduate seminar, but I was given permission to sit in on it by, by Dr. Rick LaFleur, who was the head of, of classics at um, University of Georgia. And I just remember being so shocked at these Catullus poems. I mean, again, think I'm looking at these journals in like the mid eighties and the nineties. And I think this was not a shining moment in American poetry. And like, there were just all these really boring, boring, flaccid free verse 
poems about someone goes out, pours coffee on their porch and has some kind of, you know, micro epiphany. And <laughs> so true. <laughs> And, um, you know, and then I was in this Catellus class and there are these really tightly written, you know, measuring each syllable metrical poems, but they're about, you know, sex and love and about his friends and about, you know, someone goes to a dinner party and steals a napkin. And it it felt more more contemporary than the things that were in APR, for instance. You know, it was just it just I felt like, wow, this this could be someone I know talking to someone I know, you know, and I, I think that that this idea that you could be very contemporary and risque if you wanted to be or, or whatever you wanted to do and do it while you're scanning and, you know, also making mythological erudite references. I think that was also one of those moments. Yeah, and the emotional range too. I mean, you read Catullus and there's hate, you know, I love and I hate Whereas, you know, for much of at least American poetry, it's forbidden to have negative feelings. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you have to, it has to end positively, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> it's true. Well, you said you're not a country girl, but you have an awful lot of animals and flowers and plants in your poems. Has this been since you've lived in Greece? And what I really wanted to know was, um, do you are poetic forms for you a natural extension of natural forms? Um, well, I th oh, those are those are two very good questions. Um, I mean, in a, I'm not a country girl in the sense that I grew up in the suburbs, but also my father was a big outdoorsman, and I did spend a lot of time, you know, fishing and arid hunting and out in the woods. Also, Atlanta was like a forest. I mean, your backyard would, you know, be onto a forest or woods. Um, but it was also, you know, urban at the same time, kind of strange mix of things. Um, but certainly, as you know, like in the South and in Florida, I mean, uh, you know, there are dead animals by the side of the road. Um, there are giant cockroaches that come into the house and that we call palmetto bugs to be nice. And, you know, plants are poisonous and, you know, there are snakes in your front yard. So I think um, there was certainly a sense of of nature being everywhere. And, you um, I don't know. I think animals, I love animal poems too. I think that's one of the things too, is you read an animal poem, you're like, gosh, I wish I could do that. That's something I would like to do. Um, because I think it, for me, it's very helpful to get out of the sort of cons human concerns, for instance. I mean, I to look at an animal and it's sort of otherness and it's very particular otherness um, and try to, you know, whether it's to just describe it or to have something of the emotion that you have when you see it or when it sees you. I think that's also, you know, when you're seen by an animal, it feels very different from being seen by a person. Um, and, you know, I think there's also, you know, whether it's Lesbia's dead sparrow, there's a, there's a long, a long tradition also from the, from the classical world of, of mourning dead creatures. Um, whether, form adds to that I don't know I mean I sort of feel I do feel that syllabics particularly and I'm very interested in syllabics um do have something more kind of organic going on for them um I think they are very good at dealing with the natural world but but maybe there's something very organic about regular meter and stances too I don't know there's certainly very something very structural about them which which appeals to me and you know you write these wonderful stanzaic um poems where i'm i'm always amazed at, at what is happening in them and the, the 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 structure um that is so important just even the physical structure of the poem um i mean i love stanzas i think that's something that we share yeah. that we're, we're yeah. both big fans of of stanza patterns yeah, I, I don't seem to be able to do it without them anymore, honestly. Yeah. I'm looking at the Q&A now, uh, Q&A box. And um, I, Susan Monks asks, have any of your poems been set to music? Quite a lot of my poems have been set to music. Um, I've been very lucky. I've had them set by, you know, um, folk musicians and more popular mus musicians and 
formally set in song cycles and um, in in more classical um, ways. Some poems have been set more than once. Um, Why should the devil get all the good tunes has been, I guess, kind of lends itself and has been set in many different kinds of ways. Um, I I think partly composers and songwriters are often looking for things to set to music and um, maybe the word has got out or something. <laughs> They're like, these might work, um, but it's always really neat. I mean, I'm not a songwriter. I think that's a completely different thing, but it's it's really cool when someone does something with your poems that that you wouldn't have done yourself. Um, Michael Schmidt asks uh, about your use of Ovid. He says, rereading Ovid, his cruel and terrifying and humorous timelessness is really vivid and contemporaneous in your poems. And he, he says, how is this? He's, I think he's <laughs> marveling that you're able to bring Ovid to the fore in times like these. Um, I, I, I think I have a, a strange relationship with Ovid. I mean, I, he's not, I wouldn't have said he was like the poem, the, the classical poet that influences me most, but, um, you know, I think about Virgil and I think about Homer a lot, but the truth is so much, first of all, of what we call Greek mythology is coming out of Ovid. And in some cases, Ovid may be inventing it. I mean, just wholesale or, or changing it. Um, and some of this, I think, came from reading different accounts. I mean, I'm very fascinated by the account of Orpheus and Eurydice in Virgil. And again, Vir uh, Virgil himself may be kind of tinkering with the story. I originally, this probably had a happy ending um, because of the Orphic mysteries are all about, you know, rebirth or whatever. So if he failed to bring someone back from the dead, that doesn't, doesn't really <laughs> work as well for a mystery um but then you know you read how Ovid challenges that and changes that and I he's he's such a intertextual poet which I think is something that poets are interested in um that anytime you're reading Ovid you're also kind of reading Ovid's thoughts on other people and those little changes that he makes are always um very enlightening or sometimes terrifying. Um, like the thing with the nightingale, um, you know, um, that he switches the sisters. Um, so I'm, I am quite, I know he's having a sort of um, renaissance of interest um, with uh, uh, at least one major new translation of him by Stephanie McCarter, who's I think the first woman to put him into English verse um, the, in the entirety. Um, but yeah, I think Ovid is about reading himself in, a, in ways maybe that Virgil, well, Virgil is, but um, particularly with the myths, he gives you permission to play around with them. I mean, like those wonderful, the Heroides, where it's all of these jilted women from myth, you know, writing their husbands. I mean, like he, this is a whole genre coming out of Ovid, which I think several of my poems kind of probably fall under. Um, but anyway, I find him exciting. Yeah, he, I mean, he's my favorite of the classical authors and probably because of his femininity and receptivity and um, his, one, his heroines. Yeah. yeah. Um, let's see. Martin Stone asks about your rhyme and reverse poem. The, the poem that you read with the, that the rhymes were conceptual, not- Right. I, I don't know where I first encountered those. I mean, there are some wonderful different ways to rhyme. I'm really interested in, I mean, I love the sound of regular rhyme. I, I love that also. I'm not one of these poets who's like wants to hide the rhyme, you know, that sort of idea of like, I didn't even know the poem rhymed as if this is the greatest praise ever. <laughs> um, but I'm also very intrigued by rhyme as a method of construction and a method of going forward. And that doesn't have to be oral. It can be, again, like this conceptual rhyme, which, you know, for a poem that's about mirroring, um, where the mirror kind of reverses something I thought would be really fun. And it's a way for me, I am someone who rhymes a lot. 
you know, I was born under a rhyming planet. And sometimes even I get a little tired of it, you know, it's like you feel a little hemmed in and, um, but I'm not really very good at totally free verse. So I sometimes kind of find ways around having maybe the chime of rhyme, but I'm still having that, um, that rigor and mm -hmm. the serendipity. I think it's that the thing about rhyme is it's both rigorous and it, it's this element of free will it's the swerve it's the cleanerman of 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 poetry um you know because it it sort of makes its own reason and it finds its own way that's a really nice way to put it didn't uh james merrill say it just made him smarter oh i like that <laughs> yes i yes i agree it yes it certainly makes me smarter i mean yes that idea that the the poem finds its own way. And I think it's really, I must be, I don't do a lot of free, free verse, but it must be much harder to let the poem guide you if, if there aren't some of these kind of almost random rules that are guiding things. I agree completely. Oh, here's Boris Tralio. Hello, Boris. Hello, yeah, Boris. How have your translations fed your original poems? I pray they haven't interfered with them. No, I don't think they interfere. I mean, maybe you have less time for your poems if you're working really hard on translation, but then you can also have too much time for your poems. I mean, you know, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> you know? I mean, I think I, I, I actually to write original poems have to be playing hooky from something else. Um, I, I would, it's very hard for me to just sit down and write a poem, but if I feel like I'm supposed to be doing something else, then I, it, I can write a poem. And translation, I think you always have something to sit down to, like if you want to do your 20 lines a day. And so you can have that almost like fiction writer, not to disparage fiction writers, but you know, that sense of like, I'm going to do this amount of, of this just sheer prose writers, sheer amount of work. So like 20 lines maybe, which is actually, it's a lot for me. Um, and you can always sit down to that. And I think that keeps you sane because, you know, especially if you write short lyric poems, as mostly I do, say I were to sit down tomorrow and, you know, I hope write some kind of brilliant poem, but then the next day, I mean, I can fiddle with it, but I have to just start from scratch on, you know, <laughs> and that's exhausting. So I think um, the other thing, though, I think about translation is it allows you freedom from being yourself, um, your own concerns. You can be a different gender. You can be from a different time period. Um, you, and I've learned a lot from translation. Um, right now I'm translating a contemporary uh, Greek poet um, who's very different from, from myself. He doesn't really write in form, but he writes a lot of kind of gloomy leftist poems that, um, but that have a lot of historical sense. So I'm like learning a lot, but it's also, I, it's kind of a relief to have a break from oneself, I think. And I, you know, I think translation makes you smarter. It certainly makes you a better reader. I completely agree. And with that, we will have to close out our Q and A. Thank you, Angie, for all of that. Thank you, Alicia. That was a wonderful reading and it was great to hear you talk. And I hope to hear more readings in the future from this book. Good, okay. Congratulations and good luck with it. Thank you, Angie. Thank you both so much. Um, oh, it was it was so great to hear you chatting about them and thank you for your reading, Alicia. Um, sometimes I can't believe that these events are only an hour long and just it just goes, you know, so quickly. Um, so thank you and congratulations on the book. Um, thank you guys so much for all being here. Um, and Oh, for being so vocal in the chat, it was really great to see your messages. Um, I am once again putting the link and the code in the chat for you. Please go and buy a book. Um, um, as I mentioned previously, we're not the American publisher. So if you're in the States or Canada, please head to FSG to get your copy. Um, but everyone else, please head to the website. You can use the code there. Um, so that's kind of everything from us. And that's our final launch um, of 2022. So thank you for sticking with us. Um, we'll be back with another launch in January. Um, January the 11th, we're launching Dan Burt's memoir and his poetry pamphlet, which is out with prototype. Um, that's in the chat for you as well. So please head to the website um, and sign up for the newsletter to stay up to date with what's going on. Um, but that's everything from us. So um, happy Christmas to everybody who's going to celebrate. Um, and we'll see you in 2023. Thank you.